Life Audio. Hello, welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we discuss powerful truths to counter anxiety and fear, big and small. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and experience soul, deep, emotional, and spiritual freedom, and we want to inspire you to share that freedom with others. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn about one of our upcoming events, how to book one of our speakers for your next event, or simply how to connect with us. Before we begin today's discussion, I wanted to share about a fun giveaway I am hosting in December. I will be selecting one person randomly from my newsletter subscriber list to receive a book bundle. In that bundle includes Stand in Confidence by Amanda Pittman, Remaining You While Raising Them, The Secret Art of Confident Motherhood by Allie Worthington, Rooted, A Girlfriend Gathering Study of Philippians by Becky Harling, Better Than Okay, Finding Hope and Healing After Your Marriage Ends by Brandy Wilson, and A Faith That Will Not Fail by Michelle Couchet. If you are not a subscriber, you still have time to subscribe to my newsletter and get in on the drawing. You can do so by visiting my website, Jennifer Slattery Lives Out Loud. Is life feeling chaotic? I get it. I'm Rachel Wojo, host of the Untangling Life podcast. Don't miss the passionate encouragement and faith-based resources you need to help you clear your head and calm your heart. As Shell says, it feels like Rachel always knows what I need to hear. She keeps it real and is so humble. Her podcast is just the cherry on top. Enjoy Untangling Life with Rachel Wojo on lifeaudio.com or your favorite podcast app now. Whether you're into running or running or running or running or running that's actually mostly walking, running with the Peloton tread isn't just one thing. From walks and hikes to sprint intervals, we have classes for every level and instructors to support you all the way through. Whatever you're in the mood for, we can get you in the zone. See for yourself with a 30-day home trial. Visit onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Terms apply. Jennifer Slattery. And if you're like me, most of your fears center on those you love. When my daughter was in college, her school was about an hour away, close enough for her to come home on the weekend, which she often did, spending time with her friends until the last possible moment, driving back to her dorms much later than I liked. And I experienced similar anxiety when my husband used to travel frequently. And I know I'm not alone in this. According to a recent survey we conducted, for many of us, our greatest fear is that of losing someone we love. We're afraid, were we to lose them, that we'd never emotionally recover or that we'd never experience the same level of joy again. My guest, Lauren Hostetler, owner of Mo Mountains, gets it, and she has experienced God's goodness in the midst of her fear. She's here to attest to God's promise to give us vibrant and thriving life, even after someone we hold dear dies. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. Jennifer, thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor to be here. Lauren Hostetler is no stranger to fear in hard times. She experienced a horrible tragedy in 2009 when her mother died suddenly in an accident while Lauren was in college. Lauren's faith has always been a solid foundation for her, and it was especially challenged as she was faced with the grief and the pain of losing such a stable, influential person in her life. Lauren went on to finish college, and she's now a nurse, a wife, a dog mom, I love that. (laughs) And founder of Mo Mountains, a business that takes women into the mountains on backpacking trips. Lauren is passionate about getting women together and getting them outside as she's personally experienced the healing effects that God's creation has on those who are hurting or searching. She loves gathering and empowering women to start new adventures because she believes that life changing things happen when women are supporting each other. You can connect with her on Instagram. We're going to link to her Instagram account in our show notes. And we'll also link to her website, Mo Mountains, M-O-E, mountains.com. 
And I know a bit of your story. It comes from a place of like, you, like your bio said, you lost a major a stabilizing force in your life that had to be very challenging. Yeah, it, it was. It was not something that I ever pictured for my life or could have predicted. You know, I always kind of had this expectation that my family is stable and together. And you just always kind of think they're going to be there for all the big moments and you know, they'll turn into grandparents. And, you know, this was not something that was even slightly on the radar for me. Tell me a little about, so I'm a mama and there's something with our girls. I just kind of say with our kids. So tell me a little about your relationship with your mom. Yes. It was so healthy. You hear there's a spectrum of relationships, mother-daughter relationships. And my relationship with my mom was so balanced and healthy. She, Praise God. Yes. Yeah. There's four. I'm, I'm the oldest and I have three younger brothers. So there's four of us. And she was a stay at home mom. She decided when I was born to quit her job and she just wanted to raise us kids and she actually homeschooled us all. So she was around a lot. I remember waking up and mom was there and she just was very provide a lot of order and she taught us everything we know. She was very empowering where I came home one day and was like, I want to learn how to ride a horse. And she was like, let's go find a barn. Awesome. And, you know, so she was like, she would see what we wanted to do, see what we were excited about and passionate about. And she would, she would make it happen and just She'd call it out of you. It sounds like. Yes. Yes, exactly. And then she took the time to just be very intentional with each of us, but especially me, you know, we were, we were the two girls in a house full of boys and she would make special points to spend time with me and, and have girls nights. So we would get ice cream. We would watch chick flicks. She would every fall take me to a camp that had horses and it was a mother daughter retreat for the weekend. And so like she would make very special moments you know, in my life, she took me to go get my ears pierced and surprised me with that. And she was a wonderful, wonderful mom. I mean, she sounds like we, it. Yeah. We were very close and you know, she, I, I could call her up for whatever I needed. And she was one of the most wise people. So we had, we had a really, really good relationship. So you, you really lost a, a lot. Like when I was hearing you share your story, I heard stability and wisdom and joy and memories and just precious moments. And I'm assuming that her passing was unexpected. Yes, it, it was. It was very unexpected. We, we live out in the country and this was when I was in college. And at the time I was out in Montana working at a summer camp. So I was not home when she passed away, but she would go on a walk every night, walk down our street. And it was just kind of her time to decompress from the day. Sometimes my dad would join her and they would kind of catch up. And so it was her nightly walk and it was in the summer. It was July 23rd. She was walking down our street. And I think I mentioned we live in the country and there's no sidewalks. So she's walking on the street and a high school kid who was drunk and high hit her and killed her instantly. Um, and that was that was it. I mean, they didn't even, I mean, EMS showed up and everybody and, and there was, she was gone. And so I got that phone call while I was at camp one night and my life just wow. switched in a very short amount of time. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think what's significant about this too, is things happen that we, I mean, that how you don't typically think, okay, mom's going for a walk. She might not come back. Like we, we might think they're going on an airplane or, you know, then we worry, or they're driving through rush hour traffic. And then we worry. Right. They're going skydiving. And <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. And I think yeah. that's why so many people have this fear of losing someone they love, because we know that life, like you said, can shift in a moment. And how did that, this, I mean, especially with you being in college again, like I said, I'm a mama. And I remember when my daughter was transitioning to college and those are times when you, you feel like your world's shifting anyway. And, and for her, I felt like she kind of reached out more even, you know, for that stability and, and that comfort and assurance that had to feel more stressful and frightening than I imagine than it would have otherwise. 
Yeah, it, it was a really, um, you know, it was a transitional time in my life where I didn't even really know who I was. I, I remember I went to school, uh, I went to nursing school, so I, I'm a nurse. I remember my first year of freshman college, I came home and I was like, I don't want to do this, mom. And she was like, walked me through all of that. So, um, you know, by, by the time she passed away, I was a junior, I was committed, okay. I knew that's what I wanted to do. But yeah, there was a lot of, a lot that was still unsettled and um, unknown about who I was and my own faith. And I'm so grateful for the people that we had in our life. My extended family is very close. And so they just wrap their arms around my whole family. My dad is a strong believer and he was just kind of the rock and stabilizer of our, of our family. Um, our church came around. And so really I, I, if I'm being honest, I don't think that first year was that it was hard. It was really, really hard, but I found that it was harder years, two, three, four, okay. five, as everybody kind of moved on um, and not that they forgot, but they weren't as, yeah. as, as always checking in and bringing us food and calling me up. And, you know, it was kind of like, oh, this is, this is her anniversary. This is her uh, her birthday, how are you doing? You know? And so it, it got harder as people wow. started. On. Um, so I would say actually that first year, I, I think I was in shock a lot. Yeah. It was just kind of in like survival mode and kind of like, I, I, if I could like, it was like an adrenaline rush for like a year of just like get through nursing school, just make it through and, and get home. And that was like year one. Yeah, and I was so supported and held up by everybody around me. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God looks at your heart, not your gene size. Do you know the verses yet still stress over your body? Oh, I get it. I was raised in church, but I struggled with food, eating disorders, and my body for decades. I'm Heather Creekmore, host of the Compared To podcast, where we talk about all things body image and comparison from a biblical perspective. We get real about the pressure to focus on appearance in a culture where looks seem to matter most. Whether you're wrestling wrinkles or battling the scale, Compared To Who is the show for you. You'll laugh a little and be encouraged a lot. If you're ready to stop comparing and start living, visit lifeaudio.com to listen and subscribe. At Granger, we're for the ones who pay attention to every little detail. The ones who fuss, tinker, and sweat the small stuff. Because you know the tiniest thing can make the biggest difference when it comes to keeping business moving. We get it. We're the same way. Offering access to product experts to help you quickly and easily find what you need. So whatever your industry, you know you're always getting professional-grade products. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger For the ones who get it done. Do you think also, so year two and three, did it kind of set in that, okay, my wedding day my, is, you know, is going to look drastically different. My first day at work day, like did my graduation from college, did that, you said you were in shock initially, did those, did realizing that you were going to lose out on some of those things, did that compound your, your grief? Yeah. And it, and it was kind of a, a gradual like realization of like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't think of that. You know, it's just, it's, it's funny how the brain works. I think like initially it just protected me of like shutting down and going into like survival mode. You need to graduate nursing school and get out. And, and so it was, it was that first. And then when I, after nursing school, I moved back home with my dad and got my first nursing job and, and all of that. And, and I think that's when it really started to hit me because I was living at home and I wasn't hearing her voice and I wasn't hearing the door open and knowing she was home and I, and I wasn't seeing her car in the driveway and all of that. Then it really started to sink in where I was like, mom is gone and she's not coming back. And I have my whole life in front of me. And then I started to think like, graduation and I I was already I hadn't even met my husband yet but I was already dreading picking out my wedding dress I mean like that was like a huge like dread of mine because I had always had a certain picture in my mind and you know the wedding day and you know we don't have kids yet but if if we have kids like she's not going to be there for that so 
yeah, it was after that. And especially when I moved home that everything started clicking and me being like, oh, this is horrible. Right. Yeah. I can totally understand that. Did it impact your sense of like, even it for a season, your sense of confidence in God? Like, did you find yourself wrestling more with that? Absolutely. I was so mad at God. I mean, I, I grew up in the church. I grew up a Christian and I was saved at a young age. You know, I knew all the Sunday school answers and I was following the rules. And then this horrible thing happened to me. And I remember just being like, what the heck, God? Like, I'm a good little Christian girl following all your rules in here. And you take away someone who's wonderful and you know, she, I mean, she changed so many lives. If you met my mom, you were not the same and your life was impacted in a, in a good way. And she was such a servant. And so I was, I was mad. I mean, years for, for a good three year period, I just wanted nothing to do with God. I questioned my entire faith. I was like, I think my parents were like sold into a cult. I, I think they taught me wrong. I think this whole thing is a joke. And I went down. I mean, yeah, it was it was a three year, like pretty dark time of just, you know, turning to alcohol and just calling my own shots and um, just living life on my own terms and being like, you know what, God, like you, you screwed me over pretty good. So I'm I'm done. I'm done with you. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I I can understand. I mean, I think it's cool that God can handle our anger and our grief, right? I mean, that's one of the things I love about the Psalms and Jeremiah and so much, so many places in scripture. How did he meet you in that place? In in my place of just anger and rage. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And grief, like just that whole process. I'm sure it wasn't, I'm sure it extended beyond three years, just your whole process of healing and and yeah, where where was he in that for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, he was initially, I felt he was so close. I mean, like that I, first I, year you mean, or mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, uh -huh. The first year before I got really, really mad, you know, I would, I would read my Bible and things would just jump out at me on the page. And I would just know that's, that's for me. Like he's speaking daily through his word. Um, you know, he would bring friends into my life to just minister to us and, and just bless me and, and walk with me through that grief. Um, and so I felt him very near through his word, uh, through friends the first year. And then, you know, once things started to settle down and everyone started to disperse, um, and then I went into my angry years, he was still there you know, like looking back, I can, I can see where he was. I, I, I did some really foolish things that I did not fully pay consequences for. He protected me from a lot of consequences to my choices. Um, and he spoke through, I was not reading his word at that time. I was not in church. I had nothing to do with the Bible. I didn't want anybody to know I was a Christian. So I had friends around me that were, were not Christians, um, but I still had a few in my life who would check in on me. And I remember I had a, a, one of my friend's mom was really close with me and she had, um, I was actually living in her house at the time because I was a travel nurse. And I just remember we were in the car and I was just like, man, I'm so mad. And I, you know, I. I just see the place that I'm in. I don't feel like God is here or he's talking to me. I don't feel, feel, feel. And she goes, Lauren, you can't depend on your feelings. Like your faith is not about your feelings. So don't, don't rely on your feelings. You have to go back to his word and what is true. And that was like, I don't know, that just stuck with me. And I was like, hmm, okay. So he would use people like that and say little things to just kind of chip away at my anger. And then I remember one day I was sitting in my apartment and it just dawned on me. I was just sitting there thinking about my life. And I was like, you know, since I've been calling the shots, my life has not gotten any better. In fact, 
It has gotten so much worse. I have more anxiety than I've ever had in my life. I've had, I have more anger than I have ever had. And I don't have a purpose. I mean, I, I remember like every weekend I would just go party and I would then spend Sunday hungover and just trying to recover for work on Monday. And I was like, is this it? Like, is this what, this is what my life is? It's just like this circle of just meaningless direction. And so I remember God meeting me there on my apartment floor. And I'm like, I think I need to start reading the Bible again. I'm not ready for church. I'm not ready to like surround myself with Christians, but I think I need to start reading the Bible again. And that's where it just started. And he started slowly bringing me back. So he was just patient and yes, and present, whether you wanted him to be present or not, or whether you were aware of his presence. I love his, his father's heart to walk beside you in those times. What did you learn regarding his character, especially during that really hard three or four year season? Yeah. Well, I mean, I learned that it says in the Psalms, I think it's Psalms 34, that he's close to the brokenhearted. And and that is really true. Even though my heart was broken and I had never felt pain like that before, it, it's just a deep pain and almost like a physical pain. E- even though I was in that state, the comfort that I felt, I it, it didn't make sense. Like, I'm just like, I'm hurting more than I've ever hurt in my life, but the comfort that I feel and the peace, it doesn't make sense. So he is, he's, he's close to the brokenhearted. And then something that another friend said to me in, in my anger was she was just like, you know, God hurts too. Like he's hurting along with you. Like that was, that was his child. She was doing his work and you're hurt and that hurts God. Like he mourns with us. Sin grieves him. So that kind of, that kind of stuck with me. I was like, oh, God's upset at this too. And then I learned that he is patient, kind of like what we're talking about before. I made a lot of dumb choices and he was very patient in bringing me back. And he was patient to let me come back when I was ready, which was really cool. I feel like my relationship with him is just so much deeper now because we had that that conflict. You know, every every deep relationship had goes through some conflict and you work through that and I feel like that's what me and God did. I mean, I I told I gave him my whole mind. Like I did not <laughs> I told no him filter. I, yeah. Yeah, no filter. No <laughs> filter. I said things to him that my little Sunday school girl self would have been like, oh, <laughs> to God. And he can take it. And he can take it. And he's not, he's like, okay, what what else? What else? Yeah. Th- those are a few things that, that I learned about him. That's beautiful. Now I do know because you and I have chatted a little before this. So I know he gave you this deep healing and increased intimacy with him, but you still experience remnants from that past wounding, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how how has that triggered a fear of losing those you love now? Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's always in the back of my mind, um, especially with my husband. I'm, I'm just like, you know, there'll, there'll be some days that I just feel like he's going to die. And, and it's just this like fear that I'm like, I just, I just feel like, I don't know. It's just like anxiety. And yeah, because I mean, what happened to me was supposed to happen to other people. You know, that's, that's what you hear about happening to, to Susie and her family. Like, oh, they had a tragedy. Like I always watched other people have things go wrong. It was never supposed to happen to me. And so now that it has happened to me, it's a reality and it can happen again. And so it's, it's something that I have to constantly give back to God and have that honesty with him. And, and sometimes just have like practical tools in place because I can recognize when I'm like, okay, this is irrational. So far that fear has not come true. I've had many days where I'm like, my husband's going to die and it hasn't happened. So sometimes it's practically just, just doing things like putting on worship music and just filling my mind with truth. Sometimes, you know, the Psalms are very, I love the Psalms. They're my favorite and they're so comforting. And there's a lot of emotion in there. You have a favorite Psalm that you really like when you are really needing encouragement or support or comfort that that's your go-to? Yes. Psalms 23 has always been really special to me. It's, It's extra special because my mom taught it to me when I was little. I have this just very specific memory of her teaching it to me along with like hand motions and everything. So that's always been 
one that's my favorite. And the, the part of Psalms 30, 23 that I really, really love is verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And there's just such comfort there of like, I'm not alone. Like he's not going to leave me. I'm, 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 when you're having really strong emotions, it's so comforting to just have someone with you. And that happened to me when my mom died. I was, you know, little side story. My, I was at a summer camp in Montana and my brother was actually flying out that same day that she died to replace somebody who had gotten hurt on staff. And I said, Nathan, come, come finish the summer with me. Come fill in for this guy. So he's like, all right. So he jumped on a plane. He landed He got to camp. He hadn't even unpacked his bags. And then we got the phone call from my dad. And so I had someone with me. Praise God. God specifically. Wow. That was not an accident. He brought him there so that he could be with me so that I wouldn't be alone. So I wasn't alone physically. I had someone from my family with me, but then also just having like the peace and the comfort. I remember specifically my dad on the phone and he was just like, I have something really bad to tell you. And I was just like, I remember bracing myself. And then when he told me, I just had this peace like rush over me. And it was like, it was the weirdest feeling. It it was kind of like, and I remember like, I I don't know why I compare it to this, but this is exactly what it felt like when you sit in the sand on the ocean and you have the ocean waves just like crash over you and just cover you like a blanket. And it was warm. I like felt warm and I felt at peace and that I know for sure was God. I mean, there's, there's no explanation. Like that was the time that I should have just fallen apart and just been like nervous breakdown, but I was so calm and I was just like, okay, it's, it's going to be okay. That peace of God was there. And he was, he was right there with me. I That's love beautiful. That. I love so mountains in particular, have played a big role in your healing, correct? And and in your relationship with Christ? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I grew up, that was one thing my mom was always like, go outside, go outside. (laughs) She always threw us kids outside, but no, she loved, she loved outside. She would always take us outside. We'd go camping as a family. So I love being outside and my family would vacation a lot of times out West. My dad loved mountains. So he would take us out West. And once I saw mountains, I grew up in Ohio, like flat Ohio. Once I saw mountains, I was a goner. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I was born in the wrong state. Mountains just have always been so inspiring for me. And I just, I love them. They're so therapeutic for me to just hike in mountains and be surrounded by trees and just smell the smells and everything. So yeah, I, before nursing school, I came out to Montana and I did a year of Bible college in Montana. And that's how I fell in love with Montana. Best year of my life. And um, I just really fell in love with backpacking and hiking and you know, going in the river and just doing all these adventurous things. And I always knew I would be back. And my mom knew that too, because when she dropped me off at the Bible college, she saw the look in my eyes and she came home and she told her sister, I think Lauren is going to end up in Montana. I saw the look in her eyes. So that was, that was pretty cool. And so then when she passed away and when I had my, my three years of of anger. I was in California at the time and you know, there's mountains in California. And so I would take myself to the mountains on the weekends when I had time off, I would snowboard, I would hike. And just really, it was a good time for me to process through everything. You know, when you're walking, you know, my brain is just more alive and endorphins and you're breathing the fresh air. And it was just so therapeutic for me. And I would take my journal and I would sit beside a river and just journal out all my thoughts and feelings and conversations with God. And it was just such a, such a safe place for me to process everything. So. Well, it's interesting too, because mountains are very symbolic in scripture as well, mm-hmm. meaning stability and faithfulness and trustworthiness and God's glory. So it's really cool that there's biblical evidence of just this spiritual connection with mountains. And then that's how God also spoke to you during your challenging experience. And now I want to shift just how God is. There's a verse I love that he gives us beauty in place of ashes. And I think for those who have lost someone they care about, or who are afraid of losing someone they care about, I, I think one 
thought is like, I'm never going, to, I'm never going to heal. I'm never going to experience joy again. This is going to be too much. This is more than I can bear. And I love how you've shown how it was hard, but just like when Isaiah said, you know, you won't be, you will walk through the waters. They're not going to sweep you away. You'll walk through the fire. They're not going to set you ablaze. Even though I walk through the shadow of death, you are with me. And I loved how he showed himself that way to you. But now, so now he's actually taken it a step further, right? So he brought healing and transformation to you. And now he's using you to do the same for others. Is correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this year, you know, I felt I'm, I'm a nurse and I, and I love nursing and I don't know that I'll ever get out of it, but I felt like there was something else in me and I didn't know what it was but I was like, nursing is not it. That's not what I'm here to do. Like there's some kind of purpose. And I, you know, I have some mentors in my life and I went to a conference or a, yeah, a little like weekend conference. And I was talking to this mentor and I was just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but there's something in there. And she was like, and I was just like, my purpose, what's my purpose? I was really hung up on what is my purpose. And she was like, Lauren, your purpose is to point others to God and to lead others to worship God. And so what makes you worship? Like automatically, what is a automatic you end up worshiping? And I, immediately I was like, well, when I'm in the mountains and when I'm hiking and I see, you know, something gorgeous, it just like, oh, it just leads me to worship. Like, thank you, God. Like you are so beautiful. And I just, I love this thing. Like it just, I end up praying and just worshiping him organically. And so she was like, well, there it is. That's your purpose. So like either figure out what that is and no, no small task. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went home and I'm just, you know, it, it took me about nine months to just think and pray and just process and talk with other people who have wisdom in my life. And um, it ended up that this spring, I launched my business called Mo Mountains, which is named after my mom. My mom's name was Maureen and her nickname was Mo. And Mo Mountains is a business where I take women and I teach them how to backpack and I take them on backpacking trips in the mountains. And I have just seen, it's just so many cool things happen in the mountains. You know, not only like healing for me and, and ability to process, but um, it's been so cool to watch women this summer just be able to relax and rest and connect really authentically, make new friends and like support each other and learn something new and build confidence. And, um, you know, God's creation, I just love it because I just have to take women into the mountains and then he does the rest. And he speaks to each woman the way that they need. And it has been such an honor to be a part of. I just love it. That's a beautiful story. Do you have any coming up? that you would want to invite listeners to? Well, we're thinking, so the backpacking season is over for 2023. So oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's peaking through. <laughs> the but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm seeing what kind of interest is there for a winter, like snowshoeing retreat. So we're, we're kind of putting feelers out for that one. Um, nice. but we're already planning and booking spots for 2024. Nice. I want to take even more trips. You know, I'm, I'm hiring guides because wow. I can only take so many. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. We have a big, big year plan for 2024 and already, uh, we already have women signed up and, and ready to go. And so, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome year. Well, I can see it in your face and I can hear it in your voice, but I would like to close with we, at the beginning, we talked about a common fear is that we're not going to experience joy again. Do you have joy now? Yes. I honestly, absolutely can say I have joy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been a pleasure to be here. Wireless headphones. That'll be $200. I'll use my Capital One Quicksilver card. Now that's a hit. You used the Capital One Quicksilver card, which makes you the hero of every purchase. With Quicksilver, you earn unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase everywhere. I wanted running music, but unlimited 1.5% cash back is pretty heroic. Good instincts. Every hero needs a theme song. The Capital One Quicksilver card. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details.